Hello and welcome to the 11th episode of Let's Talk Inclusion. My name is Manubina Chakraborty, the host for today's session. I'm an inclusive education consultant and the founder of I for Inclusion. Although it's half past seven in the evening here in India, I really couldn't wish you a good evening because it's only nine o'clock in the morning in Philadelphia in the US where my guest uh, Chiram Kanevel is from. Hi Chiram, good morning. Good morning. It's 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. respectively in the UK and in Malawi where my other two guests, Deborah McMullen and Jeranji Kamfose are from. Good afternoon, Deborah and Jeranji. Welcome to Let's Talk Inclusion. Hello, <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> I'm delighted to have you on my show, Jeranji, Deborah, and uh, Chiram. Before we start our uh, discussion on dealing with dyslexia, reading and writing interventions, may I request uh, three of you to tell our viewers about your life and work, please. Chiram, if you could start, please. Sure. Thanks for having me on, on your show. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, and um, our dyslexia journey started about... Um, well, now almost seven years ago, uh, when my son was diagnosed, and um, we didn't really know what it was, and um, it was a uh, you know emotional roller coaster, as you can imagine, in the first uh, first couple of months of the of the journey. Um, we were very lucky to be in an area where we have a lot of support. You know, there's a lot of um, programs that are available, so we put a plan together, and we were very lucky with the school that um, that was eager to help. Uh, the students that uh, that had learning challenges. Um, having said that, um, you know, when he, my son started uh, reading, we couldn't really find right books in between when he was able to really start decoding at a very basic level, but wasn't really able to um, still decode words with um, controlled R, uh, silent E, double vowels. So, um, so he didn't want to read the baby books. And we started seeing, um, you know, complaints from schools saying he wasn't sitting still during independent reading or quiet reading. And um, and I was saying, of course, he can't read the books and he doesn't want to read baby books when his friends are reading chapter books. And um, I said, I'm going to find these books. And unfortunately, I couldn't. So I started writing for my son, which grew to, um, you know, publishing my first book. And now we have 14 decodable books, and we started publishing for other people as well who want to be in the neurodiversity publication place. Wow. That's amazing, amazing, Chiram. Thanks Thank very you. much for coming to my show. Uh, now, Jeranji, could you tell us a little more about yourself, please? Yeah, so my name is Jeranji Kenfosi, all the way from Malawi. So I'm the CEO and founder of uh, Dyslexia Malawi Able Foundation. So uh, Able Foundation started because of my niece, so who is, I, I, I always joke and say she's 120% dyslexic. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, seeing her struggles in school and um, her life, that actually pushed me to found uh, Able Foundation. So it's the first dyslexia organization in Malawi. And we've been around for three years, so we are very new. So we're learning a lot, and I'm looking forward to learn more here. Excellent, excellent, Jeranji. I would love to know more about your work uh, during the discussion today. Now, uh, Debra, could you please tell our viewers about your life and work? Um, yes, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me here today, Manovina. And it's lovely to meet um, such passionate advocates. For, for young people who face really significant difficulties in our world of information rich um, knowledge. Um, so my, my role at the moment is um, head of student support and special educational needs coordinator in a large comprehensive school. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm really passionate about supporting inclusive practice, inclusive approach. Um, and particularly whole school approach in supporting young people who have got a range of risk factors that, that makes life a little bit more difficult for them. Um, my, my background is mostly um, working with young people 
who have had a lot of difficulty in formal education. Um, my previous job was working with young people who had been permanently excluded from formal education. Um, and, and a lot of those young people um, told stories that you know were, were heartbreaking at times of, of not feeling accepted in the culture and, 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 and actually having specific learning difficulties and a lot of them having a dyslexic profile. Um, prior to that, I worked with um, different agencies to support young people who were at risk of leaving school early. Um, so I've worked as a youth worker, I've worked with the justice system, and I've worked with um, uh, schools along the way who, who were trying to support young people who were much more vulnerable and at risk. Um, I did start life as an English teacher, um, and um, I, I was dropped into a very, um, I think, a very challenging school as my first school um, where I couldn't really understand why the young people didn't love Shakespeare and didn't um, you know didn't have this passion that I have for words and language and and what I found was that it was me the problem was with me because I, I had a cultural profile and I had um, an academic profile that made it really difficult for me to understand what um, the written word meant for a lot of those young people who, who had supreme difficulties. So, so I left the profession and, and, and went and worked in, in, in those agencies and, and, and came back to education. Um, and and I, you know, I'm really passionate about student voice and family voice in planning appropriate support. Um, I, I think the turning point in my career was when I did my master's before I came back um, into education and I spoke to young people who, who had been permanently excluded from school and, and who just told stories that broke my heart really. And, and, and a really common thread with a lot of them was that they, they couldn't really understand, they couldn't keep up with what was happening in the learning environment. So, so that really fuels me in, in, in what I do every day in my job. So, so I'm looking forward to learning a lot more from, from everybody on the call today. So, so thank you very much again. Wonderful, thanks very much, Deborah. Thanks for coming here. Uh, so in my experience working and uh, collaborating globally, I have seen that depending on uh, where you live, dyslexia may be called a learning difference, difficulty, or disability. It might not seem like these terms are that different, but each name conveys a subtle message. Disabilities are uh, lifelong handicaps, difficulties are challenges that can be overcome and differences are simply alternative approaches to thinking. What is dyslexia to you, Jeranji? Uh, well, I'm, I'm say a challenge. <laughs> because like in, in Malawi, in Malawian uh, context, if you say disability, and then people don't seem to see the disability itself being an invisible disability. It's the problem. Like you really have to explain why it is a disability because they can't see any any part of the body being disabled. So if you say challenge, that kind of goes with people's understanding. So yeah, so I go challenge as well. So it's a difficulty, you mean? Okay, yeah. and. Uh, so it is, uh, that is the way it is viewed in Malawi. Yes. That's good, to, good to know. And Deborah, you have been teaching in schools in England and heading the student support for a long time now. Uh, could you please tell us how dyslexia is viewed now in schools there and what kind of reading and writing interventions you provide with? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, um, you know, for me, I have an evolving understanding of dyslexia because it is a, it's a continuum. And, and for some young people, um, their dyslexic profile will present them with a challenge that we can support through um, the use of assistive technology or through the use of um, refined language and, and guidance in, in the learning environment. And there are some, there are students um, where it is a real disability and, and it affects them significantly and persistently on a day-to-day -day basis. So I suppose I, I've learned, I think from the outset, I have to say that, um, 
we as teachers are not trained in, in the, I suppose, the science of, of working with young people who process information in different ways to ourselves. So I yeah. think that's a fundamental challenge in the teaching profession. But, you know, I, I've sort of, I've developed this working hypothesis um, based on the Rhodes Report um, and on, I think I really respect Dyslexia Scotland's working definition as well, which is that it is a continuum. Um, it's not, it's not a, a cognitive um, impairment or an intellectual impairment. It's that a young person requires a type of intervention that meets their needs. So we, we run um, phonics interventions for young people who we feel are most at risk or I think disabled by the written word um, and, and writing um, particularly for them is really challenging in reading. So, so they will have that long-term support and check-in from us. Um, other students might require a shorter term intervention um, that, that requires um, joined up thinking with home. So it might be, um, it might be that we have a one-to-one -one program that really focuses in on um, the, the key phonetic decoding, segmenting and blending um, skills that they need, but it must be repeated at home and there must be a program and diet of reading at home. Um, I, I echo um, what, what Sigdem has said, that there really is a gap in, in the, the, I suppose, the literature that students can use to support them as they move through the different um, sort of grades of, of challenge that dyslexia presents them. Um, so there's, I suppose what I'm trying to say in a very long-winded way is that there's no one size fits all. We, we use data um, and we use um, the spelling age and reading age of students along with student voice um, to plan our, our interventions and our support for students. And, and we try to track that in a way that um, we can show the young person that they're making progress. Because very often in a learning environment, they might just feel like they're stuck in one particular group or set, and that's a bit demoralizing. So at least we can help them to see that their segmenting score is improving, um, or, or you know, they're 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 using touch typing a lot more effectively, for example. Sorry to go on. I'm <laughs> I'm I'm aware that I'm talking an awful lot. So I'm going to pass over to somebody. Else. It's of course we are sharing ideas and experiences. Yeah. Please go on, no problem. <laughs> and uh, uh, Shiram, could you please tell us about the scenario in the schools that you're part of the world as a parent, what you had to face? So um, it's, um, you know, in the US, it's really um, fragmented. So there is an IDA law, which is the um, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act that was passed a long time ago. Um, but um, if you look at the state level, there are still five states that don't recognize dyslexia at all. And there are quite a lot of um, states that are saying, oh, you know, let's put a task force together and let's talk about this. Um, so they're really in the early stages of being, um, uh, give, giving the you know, full rights to students to have access to the education that they need. Um, having said that, of course, IDA law is federal and it can be uh, enforced. Unfortunately, what I have seen is um, not a lot of parents understand what their rights are. And um, I think a lot of parents do trust that um, the schools will give the right education. And by the time uh, they realize that there's a gap and they need to take action and they have to go through a process, um, the gap between where their child is and where the rest is is quite significant. So, um, so I think it's really based on where you are, um, how much, um, how much money you have is also I think um, a factor. Can you afford lawyers? Could you afford outside tutoring, outside, um, you know, testing to um, to be independent of what the school provides? Uh, unfortunately, it's um, it's not a really good situation for um, for a country that um, that is one of the leading countries in the world. Yeah, in India, the situation is really bad because we also have uh, that Persons with Disability Act and dyslexia comes under that, but we really do not have a trained human resource, and the parents' understanding uh, needs to get better. In my current role as the team leader of a group of ACN teachers and therapists in a special education school, I made it compulsory for every teacher to attend a range of 
uh, training packages on accommodations and interventions for dyslexia. And uh, also we have regular um, uh, staff meeting for uh, IP discussion and uh, sharing of knowledge. I'll discuss it, but before that, uh, let me just uh, ask, uh, let me just get uh, your experience, let me just uh, know from your experience. And uh, uh, Chiram, this question is again for you. Uh, I just wanted to know about the books you write and publish. And it will be really very interesting to know uh, more about those books and how they help children with dyslexia to decode. If you would like to show something, that is fine. If you would like to tell us, share with your share your experience with us verbally, then also it's all right. Uh, thank you. So I don't want to steal the screen from anyone. But um, so as I said before, um, you know, my um, my experience with uh, books for my son before I started publishing um, was um, that, that there was a very big gap from early decodable books to books that he would intellectually enjoy reading. He has a high comprehension and um, and he likes high interest books with um, out of twists and, you know, character development. And, you know, it's not just, you know, one or two sentences on a page and um, and I think there's also an emotional side to this, right? Especially if you're in a classroom environment when everybody else is progressing and you're working so hard and you're not able to read the books that they're reading, I think they feel excluded. And um, But even more important, I think, is being able to practice and building that confidence that they're working hard and they're getting the results. So my books uh, focus on decodable, bo decodable words which are I mean, decodable words is, I think, a very large term, which not, I think, everybody really understands what it is. Decodable means that the reader has learned the rules to decode that word. But when you're looking at a program, um, you start with mostly short vowels and closed syllables and single syllables, and now you build up on that. And um, even though it varies from program to program, majority of the programs use the you know, similar beginning sounds to teach the young readers. So uh, having said that, um, I, I don't think there are too many books out there that are, um, you know, 100 page books like ours are, you know, we, we, our books vary from the early decodables are about two, 3000 words. Our yeah. mid level varies all the way up to almost 9000 words. And they, so they're serious as well. So what happens is when they pick up those books, they, they feel proud. They are. They give. They they gain confidence that all this work they have put in is really paying off. But they're also practicing the fluency because they have to practice what they're learning to go to the next level. I always say it's like going to the gym, right? You can't go to the gym and expect to lift really heavy weights without really building the muscles. But if you go and you lift those, you know, two pounders like I do, you never really get uh, stronger either. So you have to gradually build on that. And uh, our books are intended to be those in-between books as the kids are learning to decode more and more, um, you know, more and more sounds. There is this uh, period where they can use our books before they can jump to the other books that are out in the field. And usually it's where um, they start learning the silent E, controlled R, again, double vowels is when they can, I think, graduate to a lot more books. And our books are ideal for, um, for that period before. And we have now, you know, 14, 14 now I continually, you know, get ideas about, you know, what kids like. I, 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 I got one email from, uh, uh, from a tutor who said um, their, their student loves horses and she's asking me to write a book about horses. And I said, okay, let me think about it. And it was hard because I couldn't find a story that could be decodable with a horse because you're talking about, you know, a horse, a stable and... Um, you know, jockey, there are all these key words that I could use, but they're not decodable. And I said, I don't think I can do it yet, but I'll keep it on my list. So it's um, it's a whole process about really finding a story that could be written in an engaging way with fun characters, interesting and twisting plots. And it's long enough that actually could also help comprehension. And, and, I'm, an, I'm, an, and I'm an engineer, so I don't write like an author does. So I actually have an engineering process and 
it's a, it's a very uh, it's a very challenging process. It does take up to two years, and I don't publish the books until I am confident that everything that can come out is coming out. We run it through a software, and you know the words start popping up saying this is not really. Oh, you know, I have to change that. Sometimes the story changes because there is a word that cannot be replaced with a decodable word. So it's um it's definitely not an author. The muse comes. It's all about what those kids can read and uh, and i know that if there are a lot of you know words that are difficult for them they will get frustrated and that is not the goal we want them to feel good about themselves while they're reading and and mm -hmm. and feel like what they're working on is actually giving them results okay that's excellent are these books uh, available on amazon so um, they are available on Amazon for global purchase. We ship all around the world as well. I think so far we have shipped to 24 different countries. Um, okay. So if Love you order on our website, which is simplewordsbooks.com, I, I um, autograph them for free if you want. When you're at the, yeah, so when you have the product, you can put your you know, reader's name. And I sign okay. it personally with an encouraging note. Just one more thing I'm hoping that the reader will have an incentive to open up that book. And once they open up, what, what we see is if they can read a few pages, they actually can, you know, they, they feel that they can and the rest comes easily. So my goal is to get the reader to open and read the first chapter. Our chapters, except Sam is Stuck, which was my first book, the chapters are really short as well. Because what my son was doing is he would open up the book and he would look at the end of the chapter because he knows that he might need to read a chapter and how many pages it is. If it's more than a couple of pages, he would be like, oh, this is just too much. I don't want to read. Can you read one page? Can I read one page? So I try to you know, put all that together and, uh, and make sure that um, it's, it's, it brings success to a child when they're first starting. And yes, you can get them on Amazon as well. And we have eBooks on Amazon as well if you don't want to print books. And we have digital format as well. If you go to on our website, we have a link there where you can um, get it for screen share. Because when, unfortunately, COVID hit, a lot of schools were shut down in the US pretty much overnight. And the teachers were saying the books are in our classrooms and we don't have access to it. So we created a digital platform where um, they can actually you know, share their screen and the kids can read during tutoring or classroom time with the teacher. Okay, so are these books story books or um, they have their uh, chapterized curriculum uh, sort of uh, school syllabus wise uh, books? So um, the books are just nonfiction books, like it would be, you know, um, <laughs> like, like Harry Potter. Like we have a series called uh, The Spelling Pen, which is like a Harry Potter type of book. Um, okay. We have adventure books, we have books with, you know, pirates and bandits, and, you know, there's a lot of different. Uh, topics we have a six days at camp where kids are going to camp and it's all these adventures and the conflict between the kids and then we have um, a, an organization called the literacy nest that has created a curriculum which is also available on our website where do you have the comprehension phonics workbooks and um, and writing samples and i think there are a few games that come with it as well these books can be used as course books as well Yes, a lot of books, uh, I mean, a lot of schools do use them as part of their curriculum, as okay. well as free, free reading time, yeah. I would, I would uh, really like to see them. And um, in India, the biggest challenge is it's multilingualism. Mm -hmm. So, and, the, um, and it's a huge population, of course. The total population in India is estimated at 1.366 billion in 2019. And this population speaks at least 22 languages. Oh, wow. 22 languages. Not only English, 22 languages we speak. Except for uh, standardized screening tools in English, another moderately used screening tool in India is DALI, which is currently available only in four languages. One of those is English, of course, and three other languages, Hindi, Marathi, and Kannada. This implies that the native speakers of all other languages stand a slim chance of being diagnosed. Your reading difference will have to be diagnosed first before you can expect any intervention, right? So the challenge is huge here. So uh, we yes, we have uh, screening tools in English. And when we diagnose 
children and young people with dyslexia. We try to teach them in English. And we, of course, uh, these books can help us in that. And uh, Jivanji, could you please tell us about your challenges in Malawi and how you're providing support through the Able Foundation? Yeah, so like in Malawi, it's a different program altogether because we are the first organization to introduce dyslexia. So we are three years in that, so you can imagine. <laughs> so we, we talk, you know, um, having a lot of government schools with um, the majority of the teachers who doesn't even know what dyslexia is. And then we have only two um, universities that uh, train special uh, special needs teachers. So the first one I think was introduced 14, 15 years ago and the other one is probably four years now. So but there are few specialist teachers in Malawi. And then the problem is when they are in, in, in college, they don't learn anything about dyslexia. Like dyslexia for them is just a topic. So it's either you have to come across dyslexia somewhere and then learn on your own, or you don't. So since our ABLE Foundation started, we have seen actually a change. A lot of our teachers are um, communicating with us, trying to find out where they can do their dyslexia training to understand more um, on dyslexia. But that will be a lot of teachers coming from private schools or international schools. Because most of the teachers who are in government schools, they can't afford these trainings. But then once you have an organization, the government will assign you to a certain particular area where you have to work. So we have been, we have been given an area, so they call them zones. So in one zone, there will be like 20 schools, 16 schools with one specialist teacher. So what actually happens is if an NGO comes in, you work with that specialist teacher, and then you have to provide everything like the, the training materials and everything that they need to use in that area. So you are working with a specialist teacher. That specialist teacher has to go in the schools with whatever team you have to train other teachers about dyslexia or anything to do with learning uh, difficulties. So the area that we were given, it has about 16, um, 16 schools. But then apart from that, I have two other areas, like the other one has got 20 schools, the other one has got 13 schools. But I only got to work with the other areas because the teachers uh, showed interest that they would want to know more about dyslexia and they would want to train other teachers as well. So I kind of like let them um, work with me. And then in that way as well, I thought, because when we started Able Foundation, it was more like awareness of dyslexia because there was nothing about dyslexia in Malawi. Like you wouldn't get any information about dyslexia and I'm talking about like now it's three years. So those zero, there are special schools are there, but even if you go to these special schools, dyslexia for them is just like one of those, they, they don't really pay attention to. So I was like, oh, this is going to help me if I get a lot of teachers on board, then it's going to help me, then they can train other, other teachers as well. But then the problem is, it's like a lot of um, teachers, they're not interested in working with uh, in any special education um, centers because they think it's a lot of work. Because even if they work in special schools, whether they have a, um, what do they call it, a resource center, the pay is the same. Like a special needs teacher and a normal teacher, they're getting the same pay. So they feel like, what's the point of working with difficult children whereby they can't learn or I'm struggling, so I might, I might as well go back to the mainstream. So that's the challenge we're having in Malawi. So um, for the last three years, um, because we've done, we've done the conferences, we're covering the newspapers, the TV, I can see that there is a bit of change even in response because you get a lot of um, parents asking like, how, how, how do I know um, my child is dyslexic, where can I go, what can I do, and all those things. And, and, and I think we are actually helping in that way. And then I'm hoping, because now with COVID, we can't do anything, and like all the schools are closed. And when the schools are closed, a lot of teachers are not even interested to do anything extra or to learn or to research 
for themselves because again internet in Malawi is very expensive so it's it's more like another problem that I've seen because our government when they're dealing with uh, government um, teachers you know how they call for a training or a conference the teachers are given allowances so for you to really have a training where you're just going to teach them about dyslexia or any learning difficulties, they're not interested because they know they're not going to get paid for retain that training. So you really, like you really have to push or you really have to find passionate teachers who are really in, interested in, in, in really like um, getting to know what dyslexia is or they're trying to boost their careers, but there are very few of them. So we've got a lot of challenges, but I'm I'm hoping once the uh, once the uh, COVID is gone, we're gonna go back and make noise and see where it's going to take us. The situation is more or less same here in India. Yes. Yeah, yes. Finding uh, trained human resources is a challenge, and we really do not have uh, any structured course for uh, dyslexia for teach yes. teachers training course. So, and uh, we have Rehabilitation Council of India, licensed body for mm -hmm. every teacher who is uh, catered to the, who caters to the need of uh, special uh, needs children. And uh, this uh, RCI, Rehabilitation Council of India, doesn't really run any course for dyslexia. I think there is yes. only one, and that is in one city in the Northern India, and it's a huge country. Who will go there and uh, attend that course? Yeah. And the salary of special education teachers are very less. So no one really wants to go there. And if you go for any online course, distance learning course from any foreign university, you will not get license from Rehabilitation Council of India. So uh, those who have done some of the other courses maybe are for mental retardation or hearing impairment or visual impairment. They are attending to the needs of mm -hmm. dyslexic students. They're really not trained. Yeah. This, there are, um, yes, organizations here, there, here and there uh, mm -hmm. that nonprofit organizations, NGOs, and they are trying to do. But it's a huge country, of, of course. Yeah. yeah. Right. So uh, amazing, Jeranji, and I, I really understand your point of view. So I'll come to Deborah now. Deborah, I'm just curious to know about the whole school approach towards dyslexia in general in England. And I mean, how sensitized and interested are the general education teachers to provide with customized reading and writing interventions to dyslexic students? Um, well, I think first of all, um, you know, just listening to Jiranji and, and to you, Manobin, I, I, I feel very privileged, you know, to be part of an education system that does seem to have um, more infrastructure in place to have accountability there for education professionals um, to, to, to be responsible for the young people who are in front of them. So, so that that's been it's been really important to hear that and, and to feel humbled for my position because it's easy to sometimes feel frustration, but to have a global picture now is is bringing a, a real reality to to my circumstances. So so thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I think in in the UK, um, you know, we've talked about the um, the Equality Act or the the equivalent in the states. Um, and, and recently, particularly over the last five to six years, there's been much more emphasis on the responsibility of schools and teachers in particular to be accountable as all teachers are teachers of children with identified SEND needs. Um, there's a sense of empowerment from parents as well to cite the Equality Act, um, that the teaching standards are very strong and very clear in expectations for teaching professionals to be, be completely accountable for the progress of students in their classrooms. Um, the, um, the school inspection framework has just changed as well. So um, traditionally, I think the 
the um, structure of education in, in, in England, particularly. I come from Ireland, Republic of Ireland, so I come from a slightly different place. Therefore, I'm a little bit more sort of constructive in my critical feedback of the of the English system. I feel it it can be <laughs> it, it can be very um, performativity based, and, and where you've got a, a system that's based on performativity and, and and academic outcomes that can really perpetuate deficit system so we start to look at children as having a deficit in some way so 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 I feel like we're we're moving away from that now so perhaps we are maybe two steps ahead of of where you are um, in, in terms of trying to engage your, your teaching professionals to be responsible for their own training um, so so we, we've got we've got a situation now where the inspection framework is is very clearly and squarely saying to schools, you are absolutely accountable for the progress of every young person in your school. And you must be aware if they've got a special educational need and you must put provision in place for them. So, so you know, we, we're at a point that's really exciting for inclusion, but I think a lot of schools are nervous as well because we don't have the um, teacher training infrastructure that, that makes it part of the bread and butter of pedagogy really to understand the neuroscience of how the learners are processing information and, and what the cognitive load on them is. So, so you know, there's, there's a whole school push, I think, in most schools to, to, to really be understanding of the, the needs of young people, to not treat them in a, in a Deficit way and to provide them with opportunities for success um, and and you know I've, I've, I have feel this tension with the curriculum at times because you know the curriculum is very squarely focused on schools achieving these academic outcomes and and the best way to get the academic outcomes is to attract students who are most academically inclined um, and we do have a system here I think it reflects a little bit on, on what what you were saying in in, in the states um, which is you know if if you happen to live in an area of affluence then it's likely that the school facilities and the resources that parents will have to pursue a private diagnosis will mean that that school will be under pressure to provide a higher standard of, of SEMP provision. Whereas if you, if you happen to be in a school where young people have multiple risk factors because of their socioeconomic status, mm -hmm. then it would be harder to push the agenda through you know, I, 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 I suppose that's going to be something that we all face um, at times, but it's quite strongly felt here, I think. But there's work, you know, work is happening to overcome that. So, so I hope that's answered your question. Um, and I hope, it, please, please ask me if you've got any follow-up questions. Uh, it's um, great to know that you really don't have to face the troubles, Jiranji and I generally yeah. do. <laughs> and uh, whole school approach is uh, not really exists here. Yeah. And I have a team of uh, 15 special education teachers in that uh, Sadan Foundation I was talking about before uh, uh, this program. And Sadan Foundation is basically a special need uh, school or unit, and it's located within the premises of a mainstream school. So I have uh, at present 15 members. Uh, I'm leading that team. And uh, yes, uh, we are trying to provide structured literacy and um, uh, multi-sensory approach in our own little way. Yeah. And uh, but yes, the getting getting uh, trained human resource is really, really a challenge for us here. Yeah. And that is another reason we at I for Inclusion organize free webinars, Facebook live programs involving uh, global specialists to provide guidance and support to the parents. I'd like to show you a video I have on uh, the way we try to teach in Saran Foundation. Although the approach is multi-sensory, uh, and sometimes uh, what we found that our uh, students are very interested in art and craft. So the uh, colorful craft papers 
also we, we used to uh, 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 teach them how to read. Let me just show a video to you. Let's just so yeah. I'm drawing a bulb. They are making letters. All right. <laughs> so, uh, in our own little way and uh, with limited resources, we try. Uh, yes, we are trying. I, I can only say that we are trying our best, but uh, really don't know how successful we are. <laughs> so, <laughs> that we are not. Yes, Renji. We have to learn those things from you because we are in the middle of building our education. Thank you. And now we are conducting online classes because of the pandemic. And uh, we are asking the parents to take part in the classes along with the children. Their parents are also sitting, at least one parent, mother or father. And we are asking the parents uh, bring some. Uh, things from kitchen. So if uh, a child needs to write a particular letter, we are asking the parent to bring salt, a, salt, uh, a tray full of salt, and we are asking the child to read on them. So in the Indian kitchen, you will get all the spices because while cooking, we put everything together. So all the spices are available in the kitchen and we are uh, just making use of it. So we use uh, in Indian kitchen, you'll get pulses and rice, and we are asking for all those things, and wheat, wheat flour. Yeah. We are asking for all those things, and our children are practicing writing on either on wheat flour or rice or pulses, different type of pulses. So Indian kitchen has a lot of resources. <laughs> <laughs> we are making use of it now since the children are uh, attending classes from home and parents yeah. are helping them. So uh, we always think that parents are the equal stakeholders, right? Yeah. So if we get help from the parents, I think we can do something. We have really very, very limited resources, but whatever little we have, we always uh, try to make use of it. So the clock is ticking and reminding us that it's almost time to conclude the session. So before we conclude, any concluding advice to our parents and professionals, uh, Deborah? Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, in my experience, the, the student voice and the parent voice is, is always the most important 
part of of the work that we do and and it sounds that you're doing a wonderful job Manovina of of, of bringing parents in, in closer to the learning experience um you know there's there's a lot of um there are a lot of young people who who I've worked with who just feel really lousy about themselves because they can't they can't do the things that their peers can do and and that that builds up for them and and I sometimes I speak to parents who feel a lot of guilt or feel really like there's nothing they can do but you know if we if we can spin it and, and actually look at the creativity and the, the the bright spots you know the sparkly moments that arise from 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 the I suppose the way that dyslexic learners see the world and approach problem solving then you know that that's amazing so I you know I, I think that there's a lot of work to be done to actually focus on the strengths of of learners who see the world and experience the world differently differently uh, so it sounds like you're introducing a lot of fun and creativity and laughter and collaboration so so you know keep up the good work um, and I'm, I'm more than happy to remain a collaborator to share whatever practice and training we've got in our skills um, with yourself and um, with colleagues as well so thank you thank you thank you very much I'll just I'll keep it in mind and uh, uh, Shiram what are your suggestions, concluding suggestions for parents? So as a parent myself, I say um, don't look at the learning experience as just the ability to read, write and spell and the grades the kid gets. Um, the learning is so much more than that. And the love of learning and to be able to perceive difficulties is, I think, what brings uh, success to a child in the long run not a grade that they had in, you know, second grade or 10th grade or 12th grade and building the confidence that they believe in themselves, they're hard workers and, and that they can persevere difficulties and they will just continue trying, I think is the biggest message that, um, that I, you know, I, uh, that you can give to a child who's struggling at school and truly just believing in them, in them and looking at their strengths, not just focus on what their weaknesses are and try to make up for them, but look at what their strengths are and build up on them as well. And do it in an, as, you know, as I was saying, it's an, in a creative, fun environment. So these kids are um, usually drained at school and they do need that breathing time and that time to recharge their batteries on things that, that they enjoy doing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shira. And Jaranji, your concluding suggestions and advice for our viewers, please. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I think um, sometimes we only concentrate on the, the learning part in school, that parents they should also know and understand that it's a lifelong difficulty. So after school, whether in work, in their relationship, these kids will need their support. So if they try to more them now, that means they won't have a lot of problems in the future because if they don't get that help today, tomorrow there'll be a mess. So that support they should always be that support should always be there. And then the patients as well. And then you know they should also try to cheer them up, you know, appreciate each and every step and, and uh, achievement they go through because that will help them. If they can't be appreciated at home, who is going to tell them that they're doing great? So it's always good to have um, fun support, family support, and then when they go out, they know that if they can't get support outside their home, they are okay because they have it at home. Thank you, thank you very much, Elenji. And thanks a lot to all three of you, Chiran, Deborah, and Jiranji. We really had a meaningful discussion today, and I hope our discussion has been beneficial for our viewers as well from across the world. And thank you very much once again. Thank and you. for our viewers. <laughs> thank you. And for our viewers now, thanks very much for your love and support in our journey. I will be taking a day off next Friday, 19 February, and come back to you with a fresh episode of Let's Talk Inclusion on the very next Friday, that is 25th of February, same time with a new topic and with two new specialists. 
till then take care all of you bye bye thank bye. you friends bye bye, yeah. thank you. bye. bye, -bye. stay safe